Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us from across the world for this conference on European spaces of culture, an online conference that I am delighted to moderate. I'm Sada Islam. I'm an EU commentator, independent analyst based here in Brussels, and I'll be moderating this conversation on taking EU cultural relations to the next level. We will be looking at the achievements of the preparatory action which brought together six pilot projects from across the world in Mongolia, Sri Lanka, Ethiopia, USA, and the regions of West Africa and Central America, European spaces of culture. So what are these innovative models of cultural collaboration identified? How do these projects contribute to delivering the EU strategy on international cultural relations? What are the innovative collaborative models that have been explored and identified? And how does this new sort of dialogue actually work in practice? The project is implemented by UNIC, the EU National Institute for Culture, in collaboration with the European External Action Service and the European Commission's Director General for Education, Youth, Sport, and Culture. Once again, welcome to this interesting and informative day with you, Shabbat Islam. Some housekeeping rules for you. The conference has three main parts. There's an opening panel that I will be moderating as we bring together collaborators with unions and project leaders and experts to talk about how to take this conversation on EU cultural relations to the next level. There will then be a seed session that is four parallel sub panels on four different topics, and you can choose on the spot which one of these you really want to follow. Cultural relations and sustainability will be one session. Cultural relations and digital innovation would be another. The third one is cultural relations and peace and stability. And the final one, the fourth one, is cultural relations and cultural rights and freedom of expression. The closing panel, we look at the role of culture in the future of the EU's external action. Um, the opening and closing panel will have interpretation in French. To follow the program in French, you can enter stage two. So you have joined the Consumer Platform, a virtual conference surrounding us in many stages, both at stages and various stages. If you use the opportunity uh, offered by this format, you have your own one on one discussions and to talk to each other as well virtually. We are in a virtual world, but let's make the best of it. Because all of you are joining from across the world for this online session, and I'm here in Brussels. So a word of welcome. It's now my pleasure and my delight. To turn the floor, the screen over to Guzman Palacio, who's Director of Cultural and Scientific Relations of the Spanish Agency for International Development Cooperation and Vice President of UNIC. So, Guzman, the screen is yours. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, good morning to all of you from Madrid. Good afternoon to those of you who are um, watching us from uh, other parts of the world. Um, dear colleagues from around the world, uh, dear Director General Temis Cristofidou. Dear Secretary General Stefano Sanino, members of European Parliament, Salim Behayan and Salim Ayambu. On behalf of EUNIC, I'm pleased to welcome you to today's European Spaces of Culture Conference. I am glad to address today a wide audience of European policymakers, European Parliament representatives, EU member state officials, EUNIC members, colleagues, academics, civil society, practitioners, and experts of international cultural relations and artists. Today marks the end of the first phase of the European Spaces of Culture, the preparatory action initiated by the European Parliament and implemented by uh, ONI. The project that aims to test innovative collaboration models in cultural relations between European and local partners, organizations in countries outside the EU. Uh, at the heart of the project lies a new spirit of dialogue in which equality, Mutual listening and learning represent the core values that help build trust and understanding between peoples. This new approach to what we used to know as cultural diplomacy in the field of foreign affairs. We want to create relationships with the world through culture that are based on principles of partnerships, trust, and equality. And this is what colleagues all around the world have done in the past two years. UNIC, EU National Institutes for Culture, is the European network of organizations engaging in cultural relations. Together with our partners, we bring to life European cultural collaboration in more than 90 countries worldwide, 
with a network of 125 clusters, drawing on the broad decade-long experience of our members from all EU member states and associate countries. As such, we are pleased to work together with the EU, most notably EG Education and Culture and the European um, uh, External Action Service. In this crucial project for the future of European cultural relations as an important pillar of the EU's external action. We are at a crucial point in the development of the EU approach to international cultural relations. Despite more than a year of turmoil, cultural relations have not stood still. Our colleagues and partners have shown good resilience, delivering projects and activities to build trust and understanding between peoples of Europe and other parts of the world. But we also need to look beyond to ensure that all partners are equipped to make sure that cultural exchange continues on the basis of equality of partnership, cooperation, and local consultation. The purpose of today is to show how the EU approach to cultural relations is implemented on the ground in practice, and then taking the policy dialogue on EU cultural relations forward. How is the strategic approach to cultural relations implemented? What has been achieved? How is this innovative? How did the different partners collaborate in the framework of their projects? And how does this help us forward in shipping and shaping the EU strategy for international cultural relations? These questions and the recommendations will be on the agenda of the next few hours. In European spaces of culture, we have seen six pilot projects running for just over a year in Mongolia, Sri Lanka, uh, Ethiopia, West Africa, Central America, and the USA. After a two step selection round, going from 42 applications to 10 pre selected project ideas to six implemented projects. We, hear, we will hear uh, more from our colleagues directly involved in the project in the first panel, with colleagues joining us in conversation from Ulaanbaatar to San Francisco. I wish to express my gratitude and the most appreciation to the six project teams that have faced enormous challenges over the last year in implementing their pilot projects. With such uh, circumstances, with the harshest of COVID uh, measures implemented in some of the respective countries, we are amazed by the activities undertaken and results achieved. Many thanks to our partners, DG Education and Culture of the European Commission and the European External Action Service in the coordination and implementation of the project. And a, a special thanks goes out to the members of the European Parliament who have set this project on the tracks and initiated a preparatory action and will continue to guide us through the implementation. And many thanks to you for joining us in such a large uh, number to us today. I am looking forward to, to, to today and wish you a pleasant and fruitful conference. Thank you very much. And uh, well, let's uh, keep tuned. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Guzman. You've given us a great start to this very interesting and informative day. You talked about trust and understanding, equality, partnership, and the importance of local consultations as the EU International Relations Conference moved on. Thank you, Guzman. Let me now turn to uh, a, a lady that I admire greatly, but haven't had the pleasure of meeting in the last year or so. Um, let me introduce her, Ms. Christopito, uh, Director General for Education, Youth, Sport, and Culture at the European Commission. So, Ms., the screen is yours. Thank you, Shada. Great to see you even online. As you say, we, we haven't managed to meet for a long time, even though we live in the same city. Uh, good morning, everybody, ladies and gentlemen, Dia Guzman. First of all, let me convey the greetings of Commissioner Maria Gabriel. I am really happy to be with you today to celebrate the accomplishments of European spaces, spaces of culture. You have all done an incredible job. Uni Global, as the leader of the project, the UNIC clusters, the colleagues in the delegations, and the partners in the cultural sectors. And we are also grateful to the European Parliament for their relentless encouragement and support. Without all of you on board, the first phase of the European Spaces of Culture project would not have happened. The fact that we are connected here today, even virtually, shows two important things. First, you had the resilience to continue in spite of the pandemic. Second, you had the flexibility to adapt to new circumstances. The results prove it. Your achievements are an excellent basis to build on, and they carry an even bigger weight 
considering the extremely difficult situation culture has been put in with the pandemic. The six pilot projects, which got support through funding, knowledge sharing, and communication in this first phase, have brought valuable insights. Your engagement inspired countless numbers of people across the world. You did not hesitate to experiment with a new way of working, and you paved the way for our future projects. From Sri Lanka to California, from Central America to Ethiopia, and from West Africa to Mongolia, you built connections and shared ideas. You looked at topics like the human side of technology, creativity and innovation, migration, social inclusion, peace building, gender equality, art and ecology. These tie in very well with the European Union's goals in the new European Agenda for Culture, and more broadly, the Green Deal and the new European Bauhaus. So we're looking forward to the policy recommendations inspired by the experience of European spaces of culture. They will nourish our reflection on how to imagine future models of cooperation in, in international cultural relations. They will help us identify success factors and also obstacles to avoid. They will bring practical experience into our policy making. And I'm very glad that today is not the end, but just a sort of checking point for this project. It is great that the second phase of European spaces is already happening, and the third one is in preparation. We need to continue exploring how to meaningfully and respectfully engage in international cultural relations with the rest Recording of in progress. This is a responsibility as well as an opportunity for the European Union. We have to show in practice the values we stand for, cooperation among equals, respect for human rights, solidarity, protection and promotion Recording of stopped. diversity. In short, there is still work ahead of us all. And if there is one aspiration we all share, I hope it is this one. Let the European spaces and the lessons we draw from them help us make cultural relations count in a post-crisis global society. This goal is not just borrowed from the title of a very to the point unique report from last year. It is also what we actually need to do for the future, together. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Tamis. You've actually pointed to some very important values uh, of resilience, flexibility, and excellent basis to build on as we go into the next phase, as you were saying, and make cultural relations an essential part of the post-pandemic external relations, if you like. So these are very important, and they need to build connections, which I think these projects, these pilot projects have really done uh, really marvelously, and also bringing everything online, so the resilience and the connections that come across. So thank you very much also for this very inspiring beginning. I uh, hope to see you soon. Um, let me now introduce a video by Sabine Verheyen. She's a member of European Parliament and chair of the Committee on Culture. Let's have the video now. Dear ladies and gentlemen, dear friends from UNIC, dear participants, unfortunately, I could not join the event live today, but I'm honored to be able to send my greetings this way, one of the few perks of the pandemic. This conference is all about European spaces of culture. Culture is omnipresent. It is in every aspect of our lives. It is unique in every country. It distinguishes us from each other, but culture makes us special. At the same time, it connects us. Culture builds bridges between completely different societies. The European Union is the perfect example for the uniting power of culture. Cultural exchange and dialogue helped building trust and understanding between people. Although we are very different, we are still united as Europeans. So why should we focus on cultural dialogue only within the EU? This is the main idea behind European spaces of culture. It fosters innovative collaboration models in cultural relations between European and local partner organizations in countries outside the EU. Originally, European spaces of culture was initiated by the European Parliament as a preparatory action. As it was successful, the European Commission then attributed the project to UNIC. 
where it continues to thrive since. The project is an important aspect of the EU's strategy for international cultural relations. In 2016, the European Commission and the External Action Service presented the joint communication towards an EU strategy for international cultural relations, focusing on advancing cultural cooperation with partner countries. The strategy sees supporting culture as an engine of sustainable social and economic development. It wants to promote culture and intercultural dialogue for peaceful intercommunity relations. Culture is a source of inclusive growth and job creation and the global trade in creative products has continued to expand in recent years, despite economic uncertainty. Intercultural dialogue can build and promote understanding within and between societies. It helps to demonstrate the value of cultural diversity and human rights. I truly believe that intercultural dialogue will make it easier to communicate values in other countries. Change will be more successful when it comes from the people and not the government. Therefore, partnerships on eye level are more effective. We need dialogues, not lectures. European spaces of culture can further European plans for external relations. In our globalized world, external relations will become more and more important. I strongly believe that cultural dialogue will be a big part of our European external policy. Now I wish you a successful event and fruitful exchange. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Sabine, also for pointing out that culture is, as you said, omnipresent. We're all unique but connected and the importance of dialogue, not lectures. Thank you very much indeed for that. It's my pleasure now to start the opening panel of this uh, conference. We'll be really talking about how to take cultural relations to the next level. And to join us from across the world are our pilot projects leaders, the EU delegations and Munich colleagues. And they will talk about the innovative collaboration models that I talked about earlier. So how was co-creation really practiced uh, with all partners involved, local and international? Uh, did the pilot project make a difference in their local context? And also, we will have policy recommendations coming across as well. So I'm delighted to introduce to you uh, the panelists in this uh, first discussion. Um, from Sri Lanka, we have Natasha Ginwala. She's Artistic Director of Colombo Scope, and we'll be showing you a video soon uh, on that. We also have Edina Bartolova. She's the political attaché at the EU delegation to Mongolia, who's joining us as well. Welcome, uh, Edina. Um, Alexandra Tor, she's the political and press officer at the EU delegation to Ethiopia, who will be joining us as well. Yanisi Mokulu, she's Hatch Africa and the jury member of the European Spaces of Culture. And last but not least, Julia Sattler, independent expert and author of policy recommendations that we would be putting forward to you. So first, we're going to go actually to Sri Lanka, to Colombo Scope, uh, a project that has been described as a dialogue space for peaceful coexistence, and it's linked to a festival as well. It's about change in a diverse society. It's about community involvement and intercultural dialogue, all the issues that were raised by our opening speakers. And we're looking at peaceful intercommunity relations in Sri Lanka. So a lot of ambitions, a lot of important goals. So let's have a look at the video on Columboscope. UNIC's European Houses of Culture grant has enabled the interdisciplinary initiative Full Media Collective to organize artistic exchanges between cultural practitioners from Europe and South Asia through a year of pandemic challenges leading up to the Columboscope Festival. Key activities have included holding a series of professionalization workshops for artists on fair policy, exhibition logistics, spatial design, and publishing on politics of listening, testimony building, post-war justice, led by artist and researcher Lawrence Abu Hamdan.
on self-publishing, zine-making, and artist books with Berlin-based artist Jason Dodge. And most recently, on spoken word and multilingual poetry for creatives in lockdown by UK-based Zimbabwean poet and educator Belinda Shavi. Fold has created a distinctive visual identity, collaborated on a trilingual title font design, and built a user-friendly web interface that launches the festival's digital commissions, online radio, residencies, as well as on-site activities. The digital series Held Apart Together was launched in the early period of lockdown and curfews to release a series of social media commissions, artistic dispatches, using sound, text, film, and meme culture. European and Sri Lankan artists engaged in virtual dialogues through Columboscope's artist encounters, sharing insights on the process, social context, and ongoing projects to be showcased at the festival. The memorialization project with community arts initiative We Are From Here has been collecting oral testimonies, objects, and memoirs from the multi-ethnic neighborhood Slave Island, Kompanavidya, witnessing rampant transformation, commercialization, and people's displacement. We have organized and conducted two tailor-made, research-led tandem residencies across the island, addressing aspects of botanical ecology, local sonic traditions, and social cohesion. Over the last two years, Fold has continuously expanded the partner network in order to strengthen the festival as a sustainable and multilateral platform for extended cultural exchange. From an EU perspective, Colomboscope has been a very unique and successful model of partnership between cultural institutions, the larger public, creative artists from Sri Lanka, other countries of South Asia, Europe, of course, and beyond. We hope that more artists will be able to travel and thus contribute to build bridges uh, between Europe and Sri Lanka. Against all odds, the synergies that have been uh, created will uh, gather their own momentum and contribute to uh, further mutual cultural engagement. Since 2013, the Columboscope platform, which was initially founded by the UNIC partners, has been extending its local and international relevance. Now, envisioned and manifested by a collective of creative professionals, continuous support through UNIC is an essential prerequisite to enabling long-term cultural relations. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Welcome to the Zoom link, and thanks for joining us. Apologies once again for the technical hitch, but it's lovely when technology can get you back on your feet again and we can continue this uh, very important panel discussion. So, Natasha, uh, you're joining us from Sri Lanka, and you're going to talk about Columbus Corp, the festival, right? So just uh, give us a little bit of a context in Sri Lanka under which the Columbus Corp project was developed and how it's how it's helped to create resilience and to bring diverse communities together. The screen's yours, Natasha. Good day, everybody. Thank you so much for this invitation. Um, and I'm speaking on behalf of our team here, so um, in the plural, really. In these volatile and disquieting times that we are going through, Columbus Corp's initiatives under the festival umbrella, Language is Migrant, foreground the conditions in which mobility and itinerant forms of being in the world foster a common language of belonging, liberatory impulses, and freewheeling exchange beyond the grip of nationalism, religious intolerance, and ethnic division. As the poet Ocean Wong urges, you are a participant in the future of language. Pursuant of this logic, we examine the ways in which our platform may remain generous, broadening spaces of affinity and participatory modes of cultural expression. We have learned to see that what goes on in our subtropical backyard remains linked to the backyards of many other places, all the way to where you are seated. 
And so the encounters between a circle of artistic minds contains kernels of ideas and possibilities at multiple scales that have been disseminated carefully over the past two years. And this includes when we were preparing also for this major application and opportunity. The tasks of cultural institutions, especially those taking on decentralized approaches and community roles, has become even more vital since we became part of this inaugural journey of unique houses of culture, now space, European spaces of culture. It is our firm belief that a horizontal style of working with a cross section of cultural stakeholders in Sri Lanka and Europe has enabled the collective imagination to surge forward without fear in plotting scenarios of emancipatory and daring pathways, while also grounded in the present struggles towards social justice and trust building. For decades through the civil war, cultural collaboration was heavily restricted and even surveilled. Hence, there is the huge responsibility to ensure that current generations here not only have formal access to the international terrains of cultural effervescence, but also that their refreshing and resilient positionalities are well reflected in global dialogues. Like this island, that includes a biogeography ranging from wetlands to rainforest. We remain conscious of what it means to engage with its centuries old diversity while conceiving livable cultural ecologies for the coming future. An aspect of Columboscope's continued work rests on the lived experience of artists belonging to minority groups and lasting experiences of displacement remain legible and continually narrated in the face of systemic erasure. On the question of why it makes sense to work with the EU, to interject with a biographical detail, I've been living between Europe and South Asia for the past decade. And through this intercrossing as an insider outsider, engaged with large scale and nonprofit institutional models, one has the possibility to comprehend the transformative impact of pioneering cultural platforms as well as how long drawn colonial legacies create blind spots in the codes of cultural diplomacy. Striving for equitable and innovative alliances in cultural relations is necessary, not only from an ethical perspective, it is literally the only way for respectable coexistence among countries having the youngest population in today's world. In contexts such as Sri Lanka, a reliance on direct public funding comes at a cost of creative freedom and nonpartisan views. Contemporary genre defying and experimental platforms such as ours align with European perspectives on the multifaceted role of contemporary culture as bearing a visionary and socially responsive role in the daily life of network societies. There has been a proactive collaboration with UNIC global and locally grounded since the inception of this festival seven years ago. And furthermore, concrete steps have been taken to ensure local ownership and capacity building for this model. Our commitment lies in consciously developing networks with similar cultural organizations as ours across South Asia, as well as the EU. We have been keenly working with EU-based artists, embracing diaspora perspectives, intergenerational discourses, as well as those creative actors who perform the role of pedagogues in the arts sector. You have already seen the video with some of our programming as part of this initiative. These digital and on-site programs, as well as tandem residencies we have organized, take account of the community that Columboscope has generated and thrived together with. Yet, without following a given formula on how such models must be executed, we have diligently conceived our distinctive road. Therefore, while, I'm, while our model has been well documented and remains a context for future processes of mutual learning through UNIQ initiatives, we feel that the rootedness and sustenance of a platform is critical to regenerate rather than start from zero each time. Adaptation can either be nurturing or exhausting. Through insights drawn from one's cultural surround and social reality, it performs as a strength rather than a strain. 
Long-term strategic support should remain a goal, as in this part of the world, one arts platform, in fact, performs as a whole network through which various local hosts and cultural groups remain vibrantly interconnected. In conclusion, I would add, it is plain to see that social alienation feeds tyranny. Amidst rising authoritarian forces across parts of Europe and in South Asia, it is through fostering creative interdependence, building common aspirations and genuine relatedness between people that inclusive cultural leadership can flourish. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Natasha. So talking about Sri Lanka coming out of a devastating civil war, using Colomboscope and culture to fight nationalism and uh, discrimination and bringing communities together in a common language of solidarity and collaboration. Thank you very much indeed, Natasha, for that. Uh, let's move now to Ethiopia, where the Tibet Bay Adababe project opened up community-led open space for public participation. And we're going to talk now to Alexandra Tor, who is the political press and information officer at the EU delegation in Ethiopia about this project. So um, Alexandra, where are you? There, I see you, brilliant. So tell us a little bit about the starting point of this project. Art is not a luxury, but a necessity. How did you go about it and what are you trying to convey? What is the message and what is the practicality of this, uh, of this project? Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me well? Yes. Perfect. Greetings from Addis Ababa. Uh, so, yes, as you said, the starting point of our project was um, kind of to, to put um, art, to, to make art be more accessible. We had two main objectives of the project. One was inclusiveness and another was raising awareness. And indeed, this was to, to change the perception of art uh, from a luxury, something exclusive, to something easily accessible, something that people can stumble upon um, when they walk on the streets on the, during their everyday life. And uh, this um, is specifically important in Ethiopia or even more in Addis Ababa, because when we were um, designing the project together with our local partners, we... Um, identified as one of the challenges the fact that we had very little part local participation in the pro in the cultural projects run by western cultural uh, centers so we thought okay that this means that we are doing something wrong that uh, we are creating this perception of culture of something as something exclusive something that is not owned by everyone and this is how this is how we want to change it so this is why the whole idea of putting art on the streets came from and another uh, Another objective was raising awareness, and this is also very connected with necessity, because we figured out that uh, culture is a very good uh, notion of knowledge, because through culture, through art, we can reach way broader audience uh, to talk about, uh, to raise awareness on um, very complex issues. In our case, it was um, migration, experience of migration, but the whole idea was that okay, we have some important messages about su sustainable development to convey. And usually conferences or lectures are not that, you know, not that attractive, especially for, for younger people. And what is more attractive way to convey this knowledge through art? So this was, uh, this, was this idea. Thanks. Thank you very much indeed. So I was wondering, what was the, let's say, the first one challenge that you faced, Alexandra? You said it was important to make this an inclusive project rather than an exclusive one. So what was the one challenge you faced and how did you overcome it? I mean, um, so basically the, let's say, let's talk about pre-COVID perspective. Um, so our, our challenge was that um, most of our cultural projects were taking place inside the cultural institutes which are usually in the buildings or behind some gates. Uh, so this is why we, so, well, we over, overcame it by putting art on the streets that of course sometimes wasn't that easy because we had to also convince uh, the local authorities to, to allow that. And then of course the whole pandemics come as um, 
of course, uh, we were very, very afraid. How how will it look like this inclusiveness of our project if we had to uh, put a lot of uh, our activities online? But in the end, it worked very well, thanks to our amazing local team who really took very strong ownership of the project and and ensure that uh, it will still be inclusive and reaching broad audience, even though a lot of activities were taking place online. Great. Thank you so much, Alexandra. So really putting art out there in everyday life, taking it from within the hallowed halls of culture, as it were, putting it with people, bringing it into the street and giving ownership to everyone. So very important part of this project. Let's now move to the grid. And that is also a very unique and unusual, and I should say inspiring, because it's a combination of tech technology and art, um, and to create a human-centered approach to technology and relevant links between the worlds of art and innovation and technology. So let's have the video now of The Grid. And working here in Silicon Valley, The Grid focuses on the intersection of art and tech. We want to bridge those two worlds. And as many of you might be able to attest to firsthand, Artists and technologists, they don't always share the same reality or even language or let's say same understanding of the world. But we see boundless potential in bringing these two groups together to create and to innovate alongside each other and to redefine what it means to be human in this day and age. The real value of bringing us together as a cohort is, is something that I'm really looking forward to through this initiative. Um, you know, I have a lot of respect for, for everyone at the table here, um, for the work of Gray Area, for Mutech, for Kodame's work. Um, and I think this is a really unique opportunity to use the acronym um, to bring us together and to, to do something that is distinct from what we are all doing individually. We do actually want to go into a process of uh, mutual listening and learning and into a spirit of dialogue and then come up together with um, activities and initiatives that uh, make, make, make sense in a, in a certain, um, certain environment and context. And I think this is why we can have uh, projects like The Grid. This kind of conference and this event, well, it opens our eyes to what's possible, but also what our challenges are, what our opportunities are, where we're going, how we'll get there. And over the last couple of years, we've seen a drastic shift in how citizens around the world experience their relationship to technology. Silicon Valley is a universally lauded mantra to move fast and break things has run its course. Addressing the crisis in technology, it starts with having different perspectives and reducing your blind spots. I absolutely have to become a more artistically creative policymaker. I frankly had never considered that before, but uh, I can certainly see how those uh, worlds do uh, intersect. Innovation, however, needs collaboration. And the ability to identify such collaborations, to let them grow, to let them bloom, is essential. And this is what the grid does. It creates a space for this conversation, it brings together the worlds of art, policy, and technology, and it brings, frankly, together people who normally would have never met each other under any other setting. Martin, Martin Rothbauer, uh, Tech Ambassador, Open Austria. You're going to talk to us a little bit about the grid. And apologies again for uh, forgetting your name on the panel, but I'll make up for it now. So tell us a little bit about the grid and what what is this innovation? I mean, bringing together art and technology is pretty important, especially these days. Now we've seen how much technology is around us and how much we use it on a daily basis. So let's get some insights from you. Well, thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to talk a little bit about our uh, project. I mean, if you think of it, uh, if you think of the people who create these technologies uh, around the world, uh, they're a relatively small group of people compared to the rest of society. They're often very, very smart. They're often very male. Uh, and they are, are usually 
uh, in some ways working on very specific uh, problems uh, for which they uh, need to find solutions and that need to fit to certain business models of their startups or of their big uh, tech companies. And so we here uh, in Silicon Valley, we decided to launch the grid in order to bring uh, two new groups uh, into the equation in the development of technologies and bring artists to the table because artists have a very different uh, perspective. Uh, they ask different questions uh, when it comes to technologies. And of course, policymakers uh, at the moment uh, on both sides of the Atlantic and around the world, in the Commission, in Brussels, in the European Parliament, but also here in DC uh, and even in California, there is now a frenzy of regulations that are going to shape the future course of technological development. And so we wanted to bring all these different groups together, as the EU ambassador has so aptly said, they don't usually talk to each other, uh, but we believe that artists should have a seat at the table in these uh, tectonic uh, shifts that are going, that are happening at the moment. Uh, and I think uh, at the same time, we also bring here to Silicon Valley, where so many of these groundbreaking technologies like artificial uh, intelligence have their origins, we bring to the table here a very European uh, perspective and empower our local uh, partners, our local artists here in Silicon Valley that very often uh, kind of uh, are not so much on the winning side when it comes to this uh, success story of technology. Uh, local arts uh, organizations have often been marginalized. And we also wanted to address this issue by bringing uh, our initiative uh, and also our European connections here to Silicon Valley, empower our local partners uh, and bring European policymakers, European innovation and European uh, creativity to Silicon Valley. Okay, so uh, as you said, it's normally a very small group of very male people. Uh, artists are not really at the table. Uh, European, let's say, influence and role in all that's happening is important, but perhaps not really in linkages with the community you're talking about. So how's it been going? Has it been successful? Have there been pushbacks? Uh, have you moved forward as you had anticipated, Martin? Well, it's been a huge adventure. The grid was launched uh, in reality a little bit over a year ago. And uh, one of the toughest things was how do we get uh, all these very, very different groups that all live in their silos together? How do we get technologies interested? How do we get tech companies interested? And I think in, in that respect, uh, it was a huge success. Tech companies opened up their R&D labs, brought in writers, brought in uh, artists, and also so uh, we're willing to partner with us and to partner with local arts uh, organizations. And that despite of a global pandemics, which we all experienced, of course, around the world and technology played a huge factor in mitigating against some uh, of the uh, some of the problems of the pandemic. Uh, and we were able to organize a, a virtual festival last year in September, Exposure, we called it. Uh, uh, and where we brought really policymakers, artists, and technologists from Europe and Silicon Valley and other parts uh, of the world together in a series of performances, discussions. Uh, and, and it was really a, a very a strong sign of resilience, but also of our vision uh, to expose uh, technology to the power of art, to make technology vulnerable to the art. And in that sense, I think uh, we can say the grid has taken off and it's been a success story. And we're really looking forward to where this uh, journey will bring us uh, in the coming months and years. Thank you, Martin, and good luck. So we've talked about um, we've talked about culture, peace and stability, culture fighting nationalism. We've talked about culture explaining complex topics like migration. Now we're going to talk about culture and climate, which is, of course, a big priority for the European Union, but also across the world. The European Union has its Green Deal, and climate diplomacy is now a major part of our, 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 our operations and our policies across the world. So we're going to talk about climate change and culture. And for that, we're going to go to Mongolia, and we're going to talk about the Nogun Batar Eco Art Festival. So could we have the video, please, now? Thank you.
Mongolia, we have a small but very lively European community. Besides the European embassies present in Ulaanbaatar, there are two cultural institutes, the Alliance Française and the Goethe Institute. The unique call for project ideas, called European Spaces of Culture, required the participation of three European partners, the EU delegation and Mongolian organizations. For us in Ulaanbaatar, this unique call was a great chance to intensify and strengthen European cultural cooperation and the already existing collaboration with our Mongolian partners. Uh, in хүү санаан дээр одоо дөрвөлөөд модны хэлбэртэй сагсны шийд хийж байгаа юм аа. Тэгээд шийдних нь ондаа сэд тэгний оронд салхин жингэндэг хохнууд байрлах юм. Аа үүгээрийн болохоор одоо цаг үе одоо үгийн байдал нөхцөл байдлыг санаалах гэсэн өдрүүлэх гэсэн тийм бодсноо та. За ногоон батар хэмээх юм хүү олон улсын эко арт фестивал улаан батар ярд ирэх болон залуучууд Ирээдүйн талаар одоо цаг үеийн талаар байгаль экологийн нөхцөл байдал болон ирээдүйн одоо хөгжлийн талаар эрэг чиг хандлагыг өгч байгаа гэдэгт итгэлтэй байна. Great it's it's really inspiring to see so much creativity uh, across the world I have to say it's very moving for me sitting here in Brussels to be connected with projects and people uh, everywhere uh, bringing such new ideas and making linkages uh, that one doesn't always automatically make in our very very siloed world if I may say so thank you very much indeed to talk about this Nogun Batar project art project uh, Edina Bartalova is here from the EU delegation to Mongolia I was saying Edina uh, tell us a little bit about what brought the European Union into this multi-stakeholder project what is it in it that uh, has attracted you and inspires you um, thank you for the invitation. Very happy to be here and greetings to all the colleagues who work on this very impressive project. Um, let me just start staying, stating that we are very new. The EU is very new to Mongolia because we only established a delegation here in 2018. But we are catching up very, very quickly uh, to an increasing number of projects. And to these projects, uh, we want to support causes that have an impact on the pressing issues the contemporary Mongolian society is facing. Mm -hmm. And air pollution is one of these, these pressing <coughs> issues, especially in the Ger districts of Ulaanbaatar and, and other, other cities. Um, so in, it, in addition to the projects uh, the EU and the main member states already provide funding to, we wanted to engage with the local population um, on a, on a bit of a different level. And uh, the Nogon Batar project is a very creative initiative 
to call attention to the effects of air pollution and share best practices on a more sustainable lifestyle. And to that, uh, there is a very simple method. Um, just use the common language of, of visual art. So I'm very glad that the audience who is following today this conference uh, got a glimpse of how the project uh, proved that the GER district, which is uh, usually covered in the darkness of smoke, can, can be approached from a different perspective rather than a stigma. So the project turned the district into a lively, creative, beautiful space, at the same time calling attention uh, to the pressing issue of air pollution. And through this project, um, we wanted to show that the Team Europe spirit can very well support cultural activities. As it was mentioned in the video, it was thanks to uh, three EU member states and their cultural institutions, as well as local institutions, local arts institutions, who found uh, very new, very creative ways, even uh, amid the pandemic, to make the project inclusive and connect communities and artists across continents. And, and uh, Edina, how do you see the future of your collaboration on this project? Is it something that's going to be keep being part of your portfolio, part of your priorities going ahead, going forward? I do hope so. Well, the project is just getting started because uh, it will be there as a permanent exhibition. And uh, what is very good that the local uh, population living in these areas was included in the in the preparation of the art installations uh, um, from the very beginning. So I really do hope that uh, that this project can can stay here in Mongolia and perhaps even move to another cities which also suffer from severe air pollution, which is a very serious health hazard. Thank you very much. I mean, so far we've looked at how the pandemic has actually, uh, if I may say so, sparked innovation and creativity, the flexibility that Temis was talking about among all of the projects. So many have gone online or found innovative hybrid ways of proceeding, which is Fantastic. So let's move on now. There are two other projects that we're going to showcase, uh, European Spaces of Culture projects, and uh, they are a cross-border space for professionalization and production. So we're going to talk about Triangulo Teatro in Central America and then Urban Cult Lab Africa in West Africa. So let's see the video now from Teatro, Triangulo Teatro. Thank you. Hola a todos los amigos de Centroamérica, mi nombre es Antonio Rojano, soy dramaturgo eh, y os estoy hablando desde Madrid, desde España, con motivo de que una de mis obras, eh, La ciudad oscura, ha sido seleccionada dentro de la iniciativa Triángulo Teatro. Eh, estoy muy contento de que un texto mío pues, haya cruzado el océano y que forme parte de esta iniciativa que podréis ver pronto y pues, muy contento eh, porque el Teatro Memorias y también su director Tito Ochoa han, han seleccionado mi obra y que estén trabajando con ella en una versión que, que no solamente hable, como digo, a los españoles, sino que también hable a los, a los vecinos de, de Honduras, porque es un texto que habla de la memoria, es un texto que habla de la identidad, y es un texto que habla pues, bueno, de un peligro muy constante que tenemos ahora mismo, que es el auge de, lo, de los nuevos fa fascismos, y yo creo que eso es algo históricamente también relacionado con, 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 bueno, con el devenir de Centroamérica respecto a, a, al mundo político. Entonces creo que es un texto que puede dialogar con España, pero que también puede dialogar con, la, con las realidades centroamericanas. Así que estoy muy contento y también para mí es una satisfacción enorme el hecho de que una obra mía pueda verse eh, fuera de España y que pueda prestar el interés de, de un público muy diverso. Y porque bueno, estas actividades sigan ocurriendo y que a pesar de que estemos viviendo un mundo pandémico, pues podamos estar cerca, aunque en apariencia estemos lejos. Así que os mando un abrazo a todos. Y espero que estéis bien. Hola, muy buenas. Mi nombre es Tomás Afa Muñoz y soy el autor de la obra Pim Pan Clown, la guerra de los payasos. Un texto eh, de humor que se mueve en el territorio de la comedia y que trata el tema de la guerra, pero lo hace desde la mirada de los payasos, de los clowns. Una mirada que creo que puede aportar eh, una ingenuidad valiosa a la hora de analizar algo tan dramático como es la guerra. Pues nada, comentaros que estoy muy honrado de que esta obra haya sido seleccionada en el proyecto Teatro Triángulo, en el que se crean sinergias de un lado y del otro del océano, y me parece maravilloso que existan este tipo de iniciativas que 
que hacen que confluyan eh, las creatividades europeas con las latinoamericanas. La delegación de la Unión Europea en El Salvador apoyó decididamente el proyecto Triángulo Teatro, convencida de que la cooperación, el diálogo y la movilidad entre artistas de Centroamérica y actores europeos en la región es un aspecto clave del diálogo intercultural. Triángulo Teatro fue un excelente canal para divulgar obras de arte y productos culturales entre El Salvador, Guatemala y Honduras, logrando difundir ideas novedosas, establecer vínculos directos e indirectos y favorecer la innovación. Pienso que Triángulo Teatro ha conseguido reforzar la cooperación cultural con los socios de la Unión Europea y facilitar la apertura de los espacios culturales europeos y centroamericanos hacia una verdadera diplomacia cultural entre nuestras regiones. El proyecto tuvo tres ejes fundamentales. Por una parte, hacer un recorrido histórico por las mujeres que escribieron dramaturgia previa a nosotras. Por, otro, por otra parte, era ponernos en contacto con las mujeres de diferentes generaciones que constituimos el proyecto y hablar, en, a, a crear un diálogo, un encuentro sobre los temas y las necesidades discursivas que tenemos en este momento en la escena centroamericana. Y por otra parte, era proveernos de un material técnico, teórico, práctico para escribir y fortalecer nuestra práctica escénica a través de la producción de textos teatrales escritos por nosotras, escritos por mujeres. Triángulo de Teatro es un proyecto teatral en donde le hemos dado mucha importancia a la idea de generar redes, un cruce de caminos teatral en donde se encuentran las compañías de teatro de diferentes países centroamericanos con autores y autoras de otro continente, Europa y a su vez con público de todas las partes del mundo. Este enfoque regional, entendido como un valor añadido, nos recuerda la importancia de la creación de redes y alianzas en el trabajo cultural. Y es que sin el apoyo de los 14 socios del proyecto, entre delegaciones de la Unión Europea, socios locales y centros culturales europeos, habría sido imposible enfrentar los retos que nos encontramos durante el proyecto. Y el problema, todos ustedes lo conocen. Un proyecto que se basaba en encontrarnos en estar cerca los unos de los otros en una sala teatral, compartiendo historias, se volvió algo completamente imposible. Las restricciones de la COVID-19 nos obligaron, como a todos y a todas, a buscar soluciones tecnológicas que nos permitieran mantener la distancia social, pero no perder la cercanía humana. Webinars, encuentros con los autores y autoras, jornadas de formación, todo se volvió virtual. Lo que en un principio era un hándicap se convirtió finalmente en una ventaja que nos permitió en la primera semana de nuestro festival virtual tener más de 4.500 visitas en nuestra plataforma y cerca de 2.200 reproducciones de nosotros. Let's watch the video now on Urban Cult Lab Africa. Le projet Urban Cult Lab Africa a favorisé le rapprochement entre les domaines de la culture et du numérique. Il a notamment permis de valoriser, par le biais de plateformes digitales qui sont en cours de constitution, le patrimoine immatériel, musical et mémoriel de plusieurs pays africains. Il a enfin appuyé les dynamiques collaboratives, le métissage, les circulations culturelles et artistiques entre l'Afrique, les Caraïbes et l'Europe. Le projet Urban Cut Lab Africa a permis de renforcer le lien entre euh, les, les, les acteurs du numérique, que sont les Fab Labs euh, de la sous-région et euh, les acteurs culturels, les différents acteurs culturels qui ont contribué à ce projet. Euh, donc concrètement, il a été question en fait, d'utiliser euh, les technologies, les machines, les outils en fait, de fabrication numérique que nous avons dans nos espaces respectifs pour pouvoir euh, promouvoir la culture urbaine. Ce projet unique a, a produit deux grands résultats pour nous. D'abord, il nous a permis de rencontrer un grand nombre d'opérateurs béninois actifs dans les secteurs du numérique, 
de la culture, de l'art, qui sont des domaines d'intervention privilégiés pour la coopération de Wallonie-Bruxelles et qui sont également des domaines d'intervention professionnelle très importants pour Wallonie-Bruxelles en Belgique, puisque nous avons vocation à appuyer l'entrepreneuriat culturel et les entreprises culturelles. Et une autre ligne de force a été évidemment le partenariat avec les pays de l'Union européenne, en particulier ici les Pays-Bas et la France, représentés par l'Institut français, parce que d'une manière générale, dans notre coopération, de plus en plus, nous cherchons à créer des synergies avec les opérateurs, autres, pour mutualiser nos moyens et produire davantage d'impact au profit de nos bénéficiaires. Le projet Urban Cult nous a permis de renforcer les capacités de 120 jeunes de nos lycées et collèges sur les généralités sur Covid-19, les gestes barrières et les techniques de communication aussi bien auprès de leurs pairs que des membres de leur communauté. En retour, ils ont eu à faire 3 000 bénéficiaires à travers 150 sensibilisations au niveau communautaire et 120 sensibilisations au niveau scolaire pour plus de 30 000 bénéficiaires. Il faut bien entendu ajouter que ces élèves ont également animé 234 émissions radiophoniques en français et en langue locale. Avec le projet Urban Côte Africa, vous avez désormais la possibilité d'avoir accès à une base de données sur le plan international et vous avez accès à des sonorités, des instruments traditionnels du Bénin et d'Afrique et avec ça, vous pouvez faire toute la musique que vous voulez. Nous avons commencé déjà à travailler sur le cadre interactif pour permettre aux gens de pouvoir mieux comprendre ce qui s'est passé et de le mettre en version numérique. Donc avec une carte interactive, on va mettre Castel, la porte, la maison des esclaves, la porte sans retour et autres. Travaillons avec des universitaires, des chercheurs et des archivistes. So we've just seen two uh, uh, very inspiring projects as well. And I'm sure all of you are just as amazed and as intrigued as I am on how in these very difficult and challenging times of the pandemic and everyone going digital and uh, using technology, how much creativity, in fact, and new thinking has actually been sparked by the pan pandemic and the challenges we're living through. I'm sure all of you as fascinated by these different projects dealing with such different priorities and concerns, uh, you know, climate change, peace and stability, fighting nationalism, bringing people together in very, very, let's say, polarized society. So amazing stuff happening out there. Uh, and I feel uh, really privileged to be uh, part of this uh, conversation. Let me turn now to Yemisi Mokulu. Uh, Yemisi, you're from Hatch Africa, and you were a jury member of the European Spaces of Culture. So you had the, I must say, the pleasure really of going through a number of projects and then selecting a few that you thought really deserved a, a mention and uh, to be brought to public attention globally. So uh, tell us a little bit uh, if, about how how is it now this triangular cooperation, if you like, that's developed between the European Union, UNIC and institutes of culture and local collaborators and local consultants and local cultural organizations. What what is that, what special thing does this uh, element, does this bring into, let's say, the creation of culture and cultural relations? Um, I, can you just tell me if you can hear me okay? Because I've been having some problems. I can hear you okay. Thank you so much. Thank That's you wonderful. Much. Um, but firstly, before I answer, I just wanted to say how inspiring all those projects are. And they've absolutely um, taken our aspirations to a level that we couldn't even imagine. But in response, we, um, you know, we wanted to select a range of projects that enabled us to um, really explore the breadth of partnership in in terms of format, platform geographies, interaction, audiences and outcomes. Um, so not just the um, artistic outcome, but actually the process as well. Um, so it's been really inspiring for us to see um, these projects come to pass. And, you know, we're really truly grateful for all of the um, in-country project delivery teams and the UNIC global team, you know, all the funders and partners that have had to pivot and respond to the call in terms of delivering in these unprecedented, in unprecedented times that we're in. Um, it's, it's been, you know, it's been really amazing. Thank you very much indeed. And when you were making your selection, was it very, very difficult to make it? Was it very, very difficult to make a selection given the variety that was there and the talent that was on display? 
Well, um, it, it, it wasn't so much difficult as um, the fact that we wanted to select them all. <laughs> so um, so we, we were so um, impressed with, there was a, such a high caliber of um, submissions. And I think the clarity and the conviction, basically every team member seemed to wanted to provide the same change that we wanted. Once we did select the final um, 10, which then whittled down to the final five, there seemed to be very shared vision um, amongst everybody. It was quite interesting, actually, that when we were even hothousing the ideas, there was a point where we had to change the title from houses of culture to spaces of culture to really show um, the spirit of inclusivity everybody shared. So the difficulty, um, you know, we were able to um, come up with criteria in order to select the final um, um, projects, which were mostly based on technical, how we could, sorry, it was mostly based on how different they were, but um, a lot of the projects made it difficult for us because everyone had the same vision and they did share the same philosophy and ethos. I can imagine. Thank you very much, Emesi. Uh, let me turn now uh, to Julia Stacker. So, Julia, you have first-hand experience with European spaces of culture, former director of Goethe Institute in Ethiopia, and also a key figure because of that in the stages, early stages of the project. You've worked with UNIC in researching and interviewing project participants, and you are making some recommendations. So, Julia, let's turn to you uh, to get some recommendations about how to move forward, what you've learned. Lessons Thanks, Shada, and um, a good morning to everyone from London. Um, I have indeed the pleasure to present to you now a summary of the policy recommendations. And these recommendations come directly from the experience and the learnings from these six very impressive pilot projects of European Spaces of Culture. I had the chance, so how did these um, policy recommendations come into being, I had the chance to talk with altogether 19 stakeholders from the six European Spaces of Culture projects. And then two weeks ago, the draft policy recommendations were discussed with several participants um, of European Spaces of Culture in a pre-conference. And this is how they came into being. Robert, could you move on the slide, please, to the next one already? One major finding was that there is generally little communication about this new EU strategy for international cultural relations, together with a lack of clarity what this cultural relations approach entails. Allow me briefly to sketch the difference between cultural relations and cultural diplomacy. Both approaches exist alongside of each other. Both want to enable cultural encounters with the aim to reach understanding between peoples. Cultural diplomacy wants to achieve understanding by showcasing, promoting, and explaining one's own culture, for example, through a film festival, an exhibition, a talk, a training. That is the picture with the people clapping. They like what they see and what they experience, but there is not necessarily an exchange. In cultural diplomacy, cultural content is generally used to support specific interests, for example, foreign policy objectives, economic interests, etc. Cultural relations, in contrast, rather take place at arm's length from government. Some people even speak about the absence of government in cultural relations. Understanding is here achieved through collaboration and co-creation. Cultural content is not planned anymore somewhere in headquarters, but is deeply rooted in a local context and is a result of different partners, here European partners and local partner organizations, working together in a mutually beneficial relationship. I'm pointing out these differences because the EU strategy is on cultural relations and my recommendations refer to this approach. The um, policy recommendations report lists various successes and challenges of the first cohort of European Spaces of Culture. I'm not presenting them all, but just want to highlight a few. The six pilot projects took place in Benin, Central America, Ethiopia, Mongolia, Sri Lanka, and USA, and they were all very different, as you have seen with regards to topics and the models of collaboration. But I think this is already a sign of success, the fact that the teams of EU delegations, UNIC members, and local partner organizations had the freedom and flexibility to design their projects based on local needs and opportunities. 
The projects received recognition. Five of the pilot projects managed to secure substantial additional funding between 50 and 120% of the original budget provided by UNIC. And last but not least, all six projects could be realized even under the completely changed conditions of the pandemic because the teams were able to adapt quickly. But the conversations with the different stakeholders also highlighted some challenges which should be improved for future European spaces of culture. And I think they are all connected with one overarching challenge, that these intercultural and multi-institutional big collaborations that are at the heart of every European spaces of culture project are by nature very complex. And that the different objectives and needs in such big collaborations need to be addressed so that there is no misunderstanding. So now coming to the policy recommendations. I've accumulated altogether nine main policy recommendations with several corresponding recommendations to strengthen international cultural relations through European spaces of culture. Today, I would like to highlight five of the main recommendations. The first one is take the lead in international cultural relations. The EU with its 27 member states has an unprecedented network of cultural connections into civil societies worldwide and unparalleled expertise in enabling cultural encounters and exchange. If this network of knowledge, experience and context is activated in a new model of collaboration, the EU should rightfully claim a leading role in cultural relations. Additionally, the cultural relations approach is strongly connected with Europe's principal values such as pluralism, democracy, inclusion and equality and provides the chance to make these values tangible in collaborations with different partners outside the EU. Second recommendation, um, every collaborating partner, including local partner organizations, should be aware of the difference between cultural relations and cultural diplomacy and able to commit to the cultural relations approach. Third one. The current setup of European spaces of culture is brilliant to find the right projects and to support the initial phase. However, European spaces of culture stops at the wrong moment. All six pilot projects are currently in a phase of growth. They attract further partners and audiences. A second project phase with flexible funding schemes for successful and promising projects should therefore be added to engage with these growing networks. Number four, um, this recommendation refer, um, here's to, um, the recommendation is to transfer European spaces of culture from the pilot phase into a permanent tool in external relations. A bigger budget should also include expenditure for staff as cultural relations rely on the ability of different partners to share their expertise and networks to create new connections, ideas and solutions. But careful, staff members for these projects should come from within the participating organizations as the forming of connections is based on internal knowledge and experience and cannot be easily outsourced, outsourced to external project staff. And the fifth recommendation, projects and cultural relations don't work with set deliverables, but rather focus on relationships and processes that will lead to mutually beneficial outcomes. That's why new assessment criteria should be developed for European spaces of culture with regards to calls for proposals, selection methods, and project evaluations. Success should be refined based on participation, empowerment of local actors, sustainability, and co-creation. And there's um, one other recommendation. Um, this is obviously to continue with European spaces of culture, um, as it provided a very good framework for the implementation of the EU strategy for international cultural relations. In the last part of my presentation, I would like to recommend a model for the future of European spaces of culture, a further development of the existing processes. So how to select the European spaces of culture? Um, defining of the most promising projects is not an easy task because the projects are all developed in a local context and therefore very difficult to compare. European Spaces of Culture introduced a two stages application process. The focus in the first phase is on the cultural relations approach. Does the project follow the guiding principles of European Spaces of Culture? 
The focus in the second phase is on the building of the collaboration between e the next slide, please. Um, so the building of the collaboration between EU delegations, unit members and local partner organizations. Because the effectiveness of the collaboration will ultimately decide on the impact of the project. Every European Spaces of Culture project should by default be co-led or even led by a local partner organization to avoid the risk that the funding partner has the bigger say in a project. There's a difference between a European collaborative project, like for example, the EU Film Festival, and the European Spaces of Culture project. Because in the latter, all stakeholders will have to commit to the EU strategy for international cultural relations. This also implies that the representatives of the different national culture institutes and embassies need to be released from certain institutional restrictions to be able to develop joint objectives together with the local partner organizations. The commitment of each party should be confirmed by the heads and directors of the participating institutions. This commitment includes dedicating human resources and including cultural relations into job descriptions. These large collaborations between EU delegations, UNIC members and local partner organizations have their challenges but they also bring countless opportunities if these different strengths, expertise and networks are combined. These are the qualities that the various stakeholders considered most valuable in their partners. The local partner organizations guarantee the relevance of the project, monitor local needs and reach out to local audiences. The unit members bring in their expertise, know-how and access to a worldwide network of creatives. They guarantee the exchange and collaboration with European actors and bring additional perspectives to the project. The EU delegations contribute their connections to relevant policy and decision makers and communicate messages across policy areas. They guarantee the recognition of the project in the host country. So this was a brief overview of the policy recommendations and I'm looking forward to the further discussions today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Julia, for those recommendations and also for providing a model for European spaces of culture uh, as we go forward. You talked about the EU's leading role in international cultural relations, and that's the topic of our closing panel discussion as well. But I just wanted to pick up on that. How do you actually see that working? How do we, how does the EU take the lead in international cultural relations? Just very briefly. Okay, so, how do you, so how the EU takes the lead? Um, as I mentioned, I think there is already this amazing network and European Spaces of Culture plugs into that and just um, continue with it, extending it and um, advocating for it. So speaking more about it, um, that starts already in the headquarters so that EAS, DTEAG, also the UNIC members headquarters, um, that everybody is aware of this approach um, because it, it is really something new, I believe, in external relations and, and can make a point or give a sign um, how the EU works, make it tangible, these collab this collaborative approach, finding solutions together. And I think it's something that you can be proud of um, and, and really make it bigger and show it um, more. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much to all our panelists, to Natasha, Martin, Alexandra, Edina, Yuniki, and you, Julia, as well, for being patient with us as we went through some technical technology difficulties, but then for giving us really insights into your work and your amazing collaboration and participation in the projects we've seen. So we're coming to the end of this morning session, a bit, uh, a bit troublesome with the technology, but I think we did really well in getting everything across uh, as we uh, intended to. So after this uh, short intermission, uh, we will be go going back to the Kofina, Kofina platform. And we will continue with the sync sessions. So you are invited to choose one of the rooms, the four rooms that you will find in the conference space so that we will keep what they are, cultural relations and sustainability, cultural relations and digital innovation, cultural relations and peace and stability, cultural relations and freedom of expression. So all of the different projects that we talk about have actually dealt with these topics and more. So to enter a sync session, you have to browse through the stages and then take your clip 
and then I'll be moderating them to plan a, a final closing session panel on the role of culture and the future of EU external relations. So now be sure also to have a look at the virtual exhibition space that features more impressions of the European spaces of culture project than we have seen so far, and you can find that in the showrooms of the conference platform. And last but not least, take a short break and enjoy this short impression of the Tibet the Adababe project in Ethiopia. We'll be showing the video here. So grab a cup of coffee, a glass of water, some tea, sit down and have a look at this wonderful video, and then go around and have a look at the exhibition. Thank you all very much indeed for taking part in this uh, first session. It's been really, really wonderful, and as I said, really inspiring to take part, even if it's virtually, in such a conversation and to meet all our panelists online. Thank you very much indeed. See you soon. Um, have a good day. Sare 